In the last lesson, we set up our Zig Invaders game with player movement using the arrow keys. But unfortunately, our player can escape the bounds of the game, which is not good. The invaders aren't going to want to do that. He needs to stay and protect, or they need to stay and protect, I should say. And to do that, we need to confine them to the bounds of the game. This is actually not a really tricky problem. Uh, so what we're going to do is update our player method. So if I go to uh, player, and then I go to my update method, I just need to set some bounds checking, right? So what we can do is we can let the position be modified and then clamp it back to reality. So reality in our case is an 800 by 600 screen. Uh, we shouldn't hard code that. We should use variables. So we're going to do that. But there is one thing that is hard coded, whether we like it or not, which is that the leftmost side of the screen, the X value is zero. So it, it, that is what it is. And it's always going to be that way. So what we can do in this case is simply say if self.position x is less than zero, self.position x is equal to zero. So clamp it back down to reality. Next, we need to do the other check, which is going to be the rightmost bounds. So we can say if self.position x plus self.width, keep in mind that the position of our player is the left bottom left corner of our player, um, or maybe top left doesn't matter too much for this case, but it is the leftmost side of our player. So we need to add the player width to make sure that the rightmost side of the player can't escape. So we need to make sure that if that is greater than, and then we need to do some more coercion here using the as built-in. So we have an as float32, and then we have float from int, and we want to say raylib, get screen width, and if that is the case, self position x is equal to as float32 at float from int, raylib, get screen width, minus self dot width. And again, we're adding the width in the check here to make sure that the rightmost bounds of the player can't escape. And then we're subtracting the width here to make sure that the player position is set in the appropriate spot. I mentioned this before. We have a lot of built-ins. We're doing some coercions between types that maybe if the types were different, we wouldn't have to do these coercions. I am really stressing that these built-ins are important to learn. Um, so it's important to get comfortable with them. So we are intentionally using some types that maybe aren't the best option. So we have to do some type coercion. One thing I'll mention, though, that is not very clear if we're calling float from int, why do we have to cast it as a float32? Float from int is not actually telling us what type of float it could be. It could be an F32, it could be an F64, it could be all sorts of different things. So we're also using the as built in to specify a more tightly constrained type than just float. So in our case, it is a float32. Okay, so we're doing some clamping. Get screen width retrieves the window width at runtime, which is super handy if you want to support resizing later. Uh, part of the reason we also didn't hard code to 800 pixels. Let me run this again. And now we should not be able to escape. I'm holding down the right arrow key. I wish there was a better way for me to show that. Holding down the left arrow key, hitting it a bunch, cannot escape. And if I do hit escape, it closes the game, just as a reminder. Okay, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit because we've really seen the meat and potatoes of how we're going to structure this. So what I want to do is we want to add uh, bullets because our space shooter needs shooting. It wouldn't be space invaders unless you had a chance to fight back. So let's create some bullets. I'm going to hop back up to the top up here. I'm going to go below the player struct. I guess I didn't need to hop up to the top. And I'm going to create const bullet. That's going to be a struct. We're going to add some types. So position x, float 32. Position y is a float 32. Position, or I'm sorry, not position. Width is a float 32. Height is a float 32. Speed, float 32. Active is a Boolean. We haven't seen Booleans yet. 
It's exactly what it seems like. If you have experience programming, you know what a Boolean is. It is a, a Boolean value, true or false. We're going to create a pub fun init method. It's going to take in a position x, a position y. Sorry, position x is going to be a float 32. Position y width is a float 32. Height is a float 32. And then the return type is at this. We're going to return an anonymous struct here. And we're going to set these fields. So we have position x, which is equal to position x. Position y is equal to position y. Width is equal to width. Height is equal to height. Speed is equal to 10.0. And then active is equal to false. Okay, so let's talk about these fields, right? So this is actually really similar to player, but with one key difference, the active field. Bullets start inactive. Why? Why, would, why does that make sense? What is going on here? Well, in games, it's common to use a concept known as object pooling, which is pre-create all of the bullets, in our case, and reuse them. This is much more efficient than creating and destroying objects constantly. When active is false, the bullet isn't visible or updating. When we shoot, we find an inactive bullet, position it, and set active to true. We've got the bullet speed set to 10, which is faster than the player since the bullets should zip across the screen. So let's go ahead now and set up that bullet pool. We're going to go to our main function, and we're going to add a couple more constants. So I've got max bullets is equal to 10, const bullet width is equal to 4.0, const bullet height is equal to 10.0. Ten bullets should be plenty for our game. So below your player initialization, you're going to add something like this. Var bullets, and we're going to make an array of bullets. So we've got max bullets and bullet, and we can just go ahead and set it to an undefined value. We want to iterate using a for loop, so we're going to say for bullets, and what we have here is essentially a capture group. So we want to capture that bullet, so we're going to capture the pointer to that bullet like so, and then we want to dereference that bullet and say bullet.init 0, 0, bullet width, bullet height. Okay. There's a lot going on here that looks very different than anything we've written so far. So let's talk about it. This is going to create an array of 10 bullets. The undefined value is temporary. In fact, we immediately initialize them in the for loop. So the at bullets piece, this piece right here, is essentially taking a pointer to the array. And then the following piece, this capture group, this star bullet in the, uh, what looks like or bars really, gives us a mutable pointer to each element. We then dereference it down here. And when we dereference it, we are assigning it to a new bullet object, so calling bullet.init. The initial position doesn't really matter since they start as inactive. This gives us a pool of bullets that are ready to fire, and in a moment, we'll actually shoot them. But before we do, I want to talk just a little bit more about capture groups and what we have going on here. So we are iterating through a list. And when we want the item in that list, we can use these capture groups right after the for loop to say, hey, take the item and assign it to this value. So in our case, it's assigning it to bullet. You'll find this pattern all over Zig. It's very, very common, and it makes working with loops very, very nice. Another interesting thing about it was if we were to add multiple things that we want to iterate over and we want multiple of them, so maybe we want like a range of numbers and bullets, 
We can have both, and we can assign both to the same capture group, and it works really, really nice. This is essentially giving us type safety and making sure that we're working with the value in the for loop that we would expect on every step of the for loop. If you wanted to do something where you don't actually care, you could remove this. Maybe you don't actually care about the bullet. Maybe you just want to log out, I have a bullet, I have a bullet, or something something like that. Don't, don't say that in a crowded mall. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, if you were to log something here, you don't have to have the capture group if it doesn't make sense, but if you're gonna use the value, you probably want the capture group. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over my own thoughts here at the moment, but I know I said capture group. That is a, that is a regular expression term. Um, payload capture is actually, I think, the more commonly used term. Uh, for some reason, capture group is what I have on my mind. I have to imagine if you pointed to this code and said capture group, people would know what you're talking about. But I, I do believe the more correct term is payload capture. Sorry about that. Okay, let's shoot some bullets from the player position. So in our game loop, after player update, we want to add something. So what we're gonna do is come down here to player update, and we're gonna say if raylib.isKey pressed, we want our keyboard key, which is raylib.keyboardkey.space. We'll use space to fire those bullets. And then we wanna iterate. So we're gonna use another loop. We're gonna go through our bullet pull, and we wanna say four bullets. We want a pointer to that bullet. If the bullet is not active, then we can say bullet.position x is equal to player.position x plus player width divided by two minus the bullet width divided by two. And this width and division stuff is essentially just centering the bullet in the center of the player, so it comes from the center. Next, we wanna say bullet.position y is equal to player.position y. Set the bullet.active to true, and then we can break. Now, one of the interesting parts here is if you really hit the space bar fast and we only have 10 bullets in the pool and you need to shoot the 11th, you're not going to be able to. I think that's an okay compromise to make, and you know maybe it makes the player more mindful about how many bullets they're firing, so they always have one ready when they need it. For Space Invaders, maybe eh, maybe people aren't really thinking about that, but for other games, that could be something to think about. So this is key pressed is going to trigger once per key press. This is different from is key down, which triggers every frame. This works out really well for shooting. That way you don't accidentally fire a bunch of bullets when you press it once and you're slow to release the space bar and multiple frames have passed. So when space is pressed, we're gonna loop through our bullet pool, find an inactive bullet, and we center it horizontally on the player, position it at the top of the player's edge, set it to active, and then break out of the loop so we're only firing one bullet per press. If all the bullets are active, nothing's gonna happen. It's a natural rate limit. So if you try running and press space, well, nothing's visible yet. That's because we need to update and draw the bullets. With the bullets, we can go to our bullet struct, And what I wanna do is come down here and we're gonna add another method. So we're gonna say pub fun update. And this is gonna be pretty similar to what we did for player, but it's gonna be a little different. So we take in a pointer to this because we're mutating the bullet. And then we are returning void because we don't need to return anything to indicate that we're done updating. If it finishes, it finishes. If it's active, so we only really want to update stuff if they're active, otherwise there's no point. So we can say self.position y is equal to, uh, sorry, minus equal, so in our case subtract, self.speed. If self.position y is less than or equal to zero, self.active is false. So essentially, if it runs off the screen, set it to inactive. We're gonna create one more method, so we actually draw these because it's hard to know if we're actually hitting things if we can't see the bullets. So another method, pub fun draw self at this. Hopefully you're getting very familiar with these concepts at this point. I'm starting to move a little faster through them. Uh, and then the return type, of course, is void because we don't have anything to return. We wanna check if it is active, 
then we want to do some stuff. And the stuff that we want to do is use Raylib to draw a rectangle. Rectangle, I can spell, I promise. Int from float self.position x. And then we want int from float self.position y. Turning Copilot off has made this, <laughs> it feels like autocomplete has gotten better after turning Copilot off. Interesting. Int from float self.width int from float self.height. And we need to give these a color. Bullets, aggressive, I'm thinking red. That seems good to me. And I'm going to add a comma right here so the zig formatter formats this nice and friendly for me. So update is going to move those bullets upward. They're subtracting from the Y. And if they go off the top of the screen, we deactivate them so they can be used in the pool. Draw is going to render the active bullets as red rectangles. So in our game loop, after the shooting code, we need to add a little bit more code. And you can see that our loop's starting to get a little complicated, and it's, it's just going to get more complicated, to be completely honest with you. But I think it'll show how everything fits together real nicely. So after our shooting code, which is right here, we want to for, we're gonna do another loop. We're gonna loop through those bullets. We're gonna capture the bullet. And then we're gonna say bullet.update. And then down here, we're gonna do another loop. Again, with the bullets, capture the bullet. And then I want to say bullet dot draw. But Brad, this is inefficient. You have two for loops that iterate through the bullets. You're totally right. Uh, this is a separation of concerns on my part. So I'm looking to separate the update logic. That was strange. From the draw logic. So we do all of our updating up here, something like this. So we have our updates and then we have our draw. I understand that you, in this case, you could just update the bullets and then draw them right away. Um, uh, you could, you could. I like separating these concerns. I understand that I'm iterating twice through the bullet array of, of 10 whole bullets. Um, it's a trade-off that I'm willing to make. You can choose to deviate from this if you'd like. But um, my suggestion would be stay with me because you'll start to see how this fleshes out more and more and why it becomes a little more useful. Okay, so if we run the game now, also worth mentioning, I'm, I'm in NeoVim. If you are in NeoVim and you are wanting to run the game without swapping to another terminal or something, you can hit colon exclamation mark to get this filter up here and then just hit zig build run. Uh, well, you would be able to do that if uh, we didn't have a typo. So I've got a typo on main.zig 165. So I'm going to hop into main.zig, go to 165. And my issue here is I'm missing the E in keyboard key. So now, zig build run. And again, if you're in NeoVim, you can hit uh, colon exclamation mark and then type zig build run. And it will actually execute um, any uh, shell program. So you can execute any shell commands. Um, using your default shell. And in my case, zig build run is all I need because that builds this and gets us going. So we have a player who is bound by the constraints of the box that they live in, aren't we all? And some bullets that they can fire. And that's me hitting it as quickly as I can. I think that works out pretty well. Remember, you can hit escape to close the program. We probably should add that at some point so people know. But for now, I think that's a good spot to stop until we move on to our invaders, which we'll do in the next module. I hope you're ready.